Hello women made in the image of God. Today we're back with another Bible in a year video and today we get to read Song of Songs uh, 1 through 3 so we get to start a new book and we get to read 2 Corinthians 12. So um, yeah, um, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word for it is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Thank you for being our God and our Savior. Um, thank you that you, um, you, you show yourself to be, um, God, our husband, and, and that the church is your bride, Lord, and, yeah, I just thank you, for, that's literally amazing, um, that that's how much you loved us, that Christ uh, laid down his life for us. Um, and you show that Ephesians and Ephesians five that, that it points it all points to you Jesus ultimately um, that the feeble human love that we see oftentimes in this planet um, when it when it's done in a godly way it points to you God um, it, as it was supposed to that's the whole point. Um, yeah, just thank you that you are perfect. You're the perfect husband, God. Um, and just thank you that you you save you save your church, Lord, and that you you wash us with the water of your word, and you purify us, Lord, and you you make us. Um, yeah, we need you, Lord, and just pray that you would give us uh, understanding as we read. Uh, this new book, Lord, uh, that you'd help us to um, <laughs> not be thrown off by just it being different from a lot of the other books in the Bible, but to um, understand that Jesus said that all scripture is about him, so oftentimes certain things have a double meaning, like it will apply to, obviously, it's talking about um, the, the book is talking about love between a man and a woman, but then we know that also the ultimate shadow is Christ in the church and and a wholesome ways. You know what I'm talking about. Um. Anyways, it's um. Yeah, I just pray that you would give us understanding, Lord, as we read that you would help us to um grow in love for you, God, and just um to cherish you the way that you deserve to be cherished, Lord. Because while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Um, greater love has none than this, that one laid down his life for his friends. Jesus, that's what you did for us. And so, um, yeah, we just pray that uh, you'd be with us as we start this new book. And give us wisdom, Lord. As we, and um, also pray that you just continue to bless our study in Second Corinthians, Lord. We thank you so much for every every word of scripture, every page of scripture, every, you're just, you're so pure, Lord, and you're so holy, 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 there's none like you, there's no rock like our God, so Lord, we just pray that as we read, you just uh, give us understanding and lead us by your spirit, Lord, pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so before we even start, um, I actually, we're going to read the notes, and they'll probably talk about this too, but I wanted to start off by watching a clip from this sermon. Um, it's, uh, yeah, so let's watch a clip of it. I mean, it's not really watching, let's listen to a clip of it, because I think that this is important before we start our study. Let's open up our Bibles to the Song of Solomon, chapter 4. There is a debate in the evangelical community about whether or not the Song of Solomon should be preached as any other thing than a description of the love between a man and a woman. Uh, a great many scholars today have uh, rejected the idea that it represents in any shape, form, or fashion the relationship between God and His people, especially Christ and His church. And uh, they have a list of, of great and many arguments to back them up. They say that this is simply a book about the love between a man and a woman. But if we were to take heed to all their arguments, everything they say, 
And if we were to approve of everything they say, we could still say this. If this book is only about the love between a man and a woman, then what is the love between a man and a woman about? And what I mean by that is everything that God has placed in creation, everything, is a teaching tool, an illustration of something about God and his relationship with his people. So marriage itself has been given unto men to teach men of the relationship between God and his people. So I believe their arguments are nullified. I believe this book sets for us many, many principles about our relationship with God, about the church's relationship with Christ. And the key word here is relationship. Relationship. Now, this man that was mentioned from the pulpit, this pastor, if I were to be his counselor, the first thing that uh, I would deal with him about would be this, whether or not he has truly ever been born again. One of the greatest problems for the rapid spread of pornography in the so-called church today is the so-called church today is not the church. Amen. The true church of Jesus Christ is fully and completely regenerate. Men who are taught of God and kept by the power of God. Now, that is not to say that a Christian cannot fall into a gross sin, but it is to say that that Christian cannot remain there in the style of life. But another thing that I would go to and, and would go hard at is this. Now, again, I want to say something. I am not antinomian by any means. As a matter of fact, Um, I encourage you to watch the rest of this. I think that he does get, uh, maybe when he's talking about like how we follow the will of God, um, he does get like, I mean, Paul Washer does get emotional sometimes. I, I really love him so much though. And I have nothing bad to say about him. Um, but yeah, you know, if you have any questions, of course you can ask your pastor about those things. But I would recommend this message. It's overwhelmingly beautiful um, and pointing to Christ, as always. <laughs> um, so yeah, talks a little bit about like an overview, I guess you would say, different things. Uh, feel free to drop any comments if you have any questions or whatever. Um, there's also some, I actually want to check out, now that we're in this book, there's some other teachings that I would like to check out now that I think might be cool um, from him on this book. But at anyways, let's read our introduction. Excuse me, sorry about that. Um, let's read our introduction notes. Song of Songs intro ESV Crossway. Introduction. According to the most common interpretation, the Song of Solomon is a collection of love poems between a man and a woman, celebrating the sexual relationship God intended for marriage. God established marriage, including the physical union of a husband and wife General 2 18, 25, and Israelite wisdom literature treasures this aspect of marriage as the appropriate expression of human sexuality Prov. 5 15, 20. The Song of Solomon has also been understood as an illustration of the mutual love of Christ and his church. It is possible that Solomon 10th century BC is the author 1 1. However, this verse could mean that the song was dedicated to Solomon, or was written about him, and therefore many scholars regard the book as anonymous. The Holy Bible, English Standard Version, Wheaton, Illinois, Crossway Bibles, 2016, so, Reformation Study Bible Notes, R.C. Sproul, Song of Songs, Intro Sproul. The title of the book in Hebrew is best translated Song of Songs, Theology of the Song of Solomon. The song is about more than love and sex, it is about love and sex redeemed. The paradisiacal imagery reminds us of the beginning, before the fall, when human love was everything God intended it to be, and nothing God did not intend it to be. The themes of delight and desire in this book show us that human love and sex are not inherently evil, but still contain a great deal of the beauty intended by God in the beginning. This contributes to a full orb biblical sexual ethic that embraces the goodness of the sexual relationship between man and woman when it is expressed in the appropriate context. The biblical covenant of marriage wherein husband and wife become one flesh, General 2 18, 25. Historically many interpreters have been somewhat embarrassed by the sensual imagery of the song, largely due to assumptions left over from the Greek philosophers who viewed the body and physical pleasure as evils, things to be escaped or avoided for the good of the soul. But scripture does not teach that the spirit is good and the body is bad, rather both the physical and the spiritual are part of the Lord's good creation. God made a world that was originally very good, commanding human beings to procreate and fill it, General 1 26, 31. Sex within the context of marriage is therefore good and holy, a gift of God for spousal enjoyment and the furthering of physical, spiritual, and emotional intimacy between husband and wife. Originally, the song was written to convey these themes, and although it does point us ultimately to Christ, we need not be afraid to read the song as an expression and affirmation of the goodness of love and sex within marriage. The Song of Solomon in the larger story of the Bible, the garden imagery in the song see explicit references in 4 12, 15, 16, 5, 1. 8 3 is intended to remind us of the Garden of Eden where the first man and woman were both naked and were not ashamed, General 2 25. 
In that way the song points us back to the beginning, when human beings were in perfect relationship with God and with one another. It reminds us that love, sex and marriage were originally good gifts and in many ways remain good gifts. Therefore, they can be redeemed from the negativity that so often surrounds them as we live in harmony with the Lord's design for them. The redemption and restoration of these relationships can be realized more and more in this life as we anticipate the consummation of all things in which everything will be fully restored. This consummation has been guaranteed by the perfect husband, the one who has redeemed his bride by loving her and giving himself for her f. 5 33 The theme of disappointment in the song confronts us with the fact that human love, like every other dimension of life has been adversely affected by the fall cf. General 3 16 19. In a fallen world, human love is no longer everything that God intended it to be. This points us forward to the hope of redemption, eliciting in us a longing for the restoration of all of our relationships and the renewal of creation that the prophets reveal as the consummation of the Lord's plan for the cosmos is. 65 17 25 Dan 12 1 2 CF Rom 8 18 25 This restoration and consummation the prophets explain will occur only through the work of the Messiah is. 53 Amos 9 11, 12 Christ in the Song of Solomon As noted, the song creates within the reader a hope for the fullness of relationship that God intended for men and women in the garden. Ultimately then Christian interpreters throughout history have not been entirely wrong in reading the work as a revelation of Christ. Only Christ can fully satisfy the longings of human beings for intimacy, for He alone is the one who provides rivers of living water that make it so we are never thirsty again. John 4 13 14 7 37 38 Even the best marriages provide occasions for disappointment, as the song recognizes 3 6 5 8. In that way the song reminds us that Christ is the only perfect spouse. Only He can meet all of our needs. While the allegorical interpretation In that way the song reminds us that Christ is the only perfect spouse. Only he can meet all of our needs. While the allegorical interpretation of the song is off target, it is nonetheless the case that the song is illustrative of the love of Christ for his church. Given the consistent use in both testaments of marriage as an image for God's relationship with his people cf. Ezek, 16, Hoas, 1 3, Ephesh, 5 21 33, it would seem odd for the song not to give us a glimpse of that bond. God designed marriage to mirror his relationship with us, so it seems natural that God inspired the song to mirror that relationship as well. While avoiding the excesses of the allegorical approach to the song, the reader is certainly invited to reflect on the song's themes as windows into our relationship with God. While avoiding the excesses of the allegorical approach to the song, the reader is certainly invited to reflect on the song's themes as windows into our relationship with God. I think that was extremely well put. That's like what I was trying to say, but like in smart people <laughs> language. Uh, thank God for Brother Sproul. He illustrated that very well. And I think in this um, paragraph, this is one of it really well. So while avoiding the excesses of the allegorical approach to the song, the reader is certainly invited to reflect on the song's themes and as windows into our relationship with God. I think that was helpful. Um, but yeah, so that being said, uh, let's open up in our Bible to Song of Songs. I don't like calling it Song of Solomon because it, we don't, it, it could be anonymous, you know, the, the writer. And Anyways, yeah, anyway, so Song of Songs, uh, chapter 1. The Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon, 1. The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Your anointing oils are fragrant. Your name is oil poured out. The Song of Solomon Chapter 1 The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Your anointing oils are fragrant, your name is oil poured out. Therefore virgins love you. Draw me after you, let us run. The king has brought me into his chambers. We will exult and rejoice in you. We will extol your love more than wine. Rightly do they love you. I am very dark but lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. Do not gaze at me because I am dark, because the sun has looked upon me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me keeper of the vineyards. But my own vineyard I have not kept. Tell me, you whom my soul loves, where you pasture your flock, where you make it lie down at noon. For why should I be like one who veils herself beside the flocks of your companions? If you do not know, O most beautiful among women, follow in the tracks of the flock, 
and pasture your young goats beside the shepherd's tents. I compare you, my love, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariots. Your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your neck with strings of jewels. We will make for you ornaments of gold studded with silver. While the king was on his couch, my nard gave forth its fragrance. My beloved is to me a sachet of myrrh that lies between my breasts. My beloved is to me a cluster of henna blossoms in the vineyards of Engedi. Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are doves. Behold, you are beautiful, my beloved, truly delightful. Our couch is green, the beams of our house are cedar, our rafters are pine. Chapter 2 I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. As a lily among brambles, so is my love among the young women. As an apple tree among the trees of the forest, so is my beloved among the young men. With great delight I sat in his shadow, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Sustain me with raisins, refresh me with apples, for I am sick with love. His left hand is under my head and his right hand embraces me. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or the does of the field, that you not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. The voice of my beloved, Behold, he comes, leaping over the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Behold, there he stands behind our wall, gazing through the windows, Looking through the lattice, my beloved speaks and says to me, Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. For behold, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth, the time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree ripens its figs, and the vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. O oh, my dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the crannies of the cliff, let me see your face, let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. Catch the foxes for us, the little foxes that spoil the vineyards, for our vineyards are in blossom. My beloved is mine and I am his, he grazes among the lilies, until the day breathes and the shadows flee. Turn, my beloved, be like a gazelle or a young stag on cleft mountains. Chapter 3 On my bed by night I sought him whom my soul loves. I sought him but found him not. I will rise now and go about the city, in the streets and in the squares. I will seek him whom my soul loves. I sought him, but found him not. The watchmen found me as they went about in the city. Have you seen him whom my soul loves? Scarcely had I passed him when I found him whom my soul loves. I held him and would not let him go, until I had brought him into my mother's house, and into the chamber of her who conceived me. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or the does of the field, that you not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. What is that coming up from the wilderness like columns of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all the fragrant powders of a merchant? Behold, it is the litter of Solomon. Around it are sixty mighty men, some of the mighty men of Israel, all of them wearing swords and expert in war, each with his sword at his thigh against terror by night. King Solomon made himself a carriage from the wood of Lebanon. He made its posts of silver, its back of gold, its seat of purple. Its interior was inlaid with love by the daughters of Jerusalem. Go out, O daughters of Zion, 
and look upon King Solomon with the crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding, on the day of the gladness of his heart. J.C. Penny. Okay, now we're going to read the notes. Song of Songs 1-3, Chapter 1, 1-1-C Introduction, Title, Author, 1-2-4, Third Person Expressions in 1-2-4, Let Him Kiss Me. The King has brought me open and close these verses, which are otherwise in the second person, your love, your name. This shifting of persons is common in Hebrew and prominent in the song. Note the sensuous nature of the language, which includes touch, taste, and smell. 1, 3, your name is oil poured out. The oil is the fragrant oil just mentioned, and having been poured out, would have filled the room with its aroma. 1, 4, the King has brought me. This is the first of five occurrences of the word King. 1, 4, 12, 3, 9, 11, 7, 5. Here in V there are two possibilities for the meaning, either the king is just that, a king who has tried to win the young woman's affections, or he is her lover, whom she romantically fantasizes to be her king. The latter interpretation is to be preferred introduction, author, chambers. The word chambers here as elsewhere refers to the bedroom, the most intimate of rooms. We will exult and rejoice in you. We meet for the first time the female companions of the young woman. They are referred to as the daughters of Jerusalem, 1 5, daughters of Zion 3 11, and young women 6 9. Here they serve to confirm the young woman's appraisal of her beloved CV 2, 1 5 6, a self-description wherein the young woman expresses displeasure with her deeply tanned skin perhaps because it makes her appear to be an ordinary laborer. 1. Five tents of Kedar. Bedouin tribes that live on the edge of the desert make their tents of dark goat hair, as was apparently the case with the tribe of Kedar. Kedar was seen as an exotic land, Jer, my own vineyard. Vineyard occurs nine times in the song, where it is an image of sexuality in general, as was the case in the ancient Near East. And the woman's sexuality in particular CA 12. 178. The young woman provocatively inquires as to where she can meet the man at noon versus 7, then the man indirectly but suggestively provides her direction. 1. Seven like one who veils herself. Veils has the same negative connotations here as it does in general 8, 14, 15. The young woman does not want to be mistaken for a prostitute. 1. 8. Most beautiful among women. Elsewhere in the song this form of address is used only by the daughters of Jerusalem. 5. 9. 6. 1. 1. 9. To first descriptive admiration of the young woman by the man. 1. 9. A mare among Pharaoh's chariots. Egyptian chariots were drawn by stallions. An ancient military strategy was to insert a mare into the mix in the hopes of distracting and confusing the stallions. The man uses the image to express his crazed passion for the young woman. 1. 10. Cheeks. Neck. The first of many references to the beauty of the physical body. He begins by praising her in a modest manner. 111 We, in verse 4, the daughters of Jerusalem, echo the young woman's praise of her lover. Here they respond similarly to his praise of her. The plural subject we goes against taking this verse as a speech of the young woman's lover using courtly language, since we is consistently used by various groups at other points in the book. 6 1 13 8 8 1 12 The king, the young woman's lover is again presented as a king, as indicated by the following verse. On his couch, lit, in his surroundings. The surroundings may not be a literal couch but may refer to the outdoors. C E G 1 16 7 Tibbon. 113 Myrrh, a gum resin native to South Arabia, it is exotic and valuable. Mixed with olive oil, myrrh was used as an expensive perfume. Between my breasts. The sachet between the breasts is an image of intimacy. 114 Henna blossoms. Henna bushes produce a substance that is applied to the body as an ointment or perfume. Engedi, this lush oasis is halfway down the western shore of the Dead Sea and contributes to the lush images of intimacy, and Engedi's location between the hills mirrors the sachet between the breasts. 115 These verses express mutual admiration, as is clear from the repetition of Behold you are beautiful. 115 Your eyes are doves. Doves occur in the ancient Near East as a symbol of love making or seduction. Here they evoke the young woman's seductive power. See also 4 1. The young woman uses the same image in 5 12 cf. Also 6 9. 1 16 or couch is green. The HB. Word translated green means verdant, flourishing, or luxuriant, and it contributes to the lush images of intimacy. 1 17 beams, rafters. The cedar and pine trees provide the privacy for intimacy that would be provided by a literal house. Chapter 2. Rose. The Hebrew indicates a plant of the bulb family like a crocus or daffodil text note. Br C is 35 1 2. Sharon. This plain extends south from Mount Carmel along the Mediterranean coast. Here the young woman modestly compares herself to familiar wildflowers. 2 2 3 in these verses, both the young man and the young woman praise each other as standouts among their peers. 2 4 Banqueting House, lit, House of Wine text note, the setting is outdoors 112 note, the lover's house to this point has been the forest 116 17. Now they move to a different house, namely the young man's vineyard his house of wine. The expression continues the royal imagery from 1 4 12 the shepherd is a king and the comparison of love and wine from 1 2. His banner, an emblem typically used to mark out one tribe from another num. 2 3 10 18 25. Banners were also used to muster troops for battle. It has been suggested that the word is used here for something like a sign for an inn. The young man is unabashedly advertising his love for the young woman. 2 5 raisins, apples, raisins or raisin cakes are associated elsewhere in the OT with religious rites, sometimes even in a pagan context. 2 Sam, 6 19, Hoes 3 1, which has led some commentators to suppose that the song originated as the script of a pagan fertility rite involving ritual sex. CF, Hoes 4 11 14. But the lovemaking in the song has no obvious cultic dimension. The raisins here, like the apples, are simple aphrodisiacs. The young woman calls for raisins and apples to renew her vigor. 2 for 6 for the role of this verse in the structure of the book. See introduction, literary features. 2 for 7 for comments on this refrain. See introduction, literary features. Here the refrain is a reminder that the lovemaking should await the right time with the right person. The broader context of scripture indicates that the right time is marriage and the right person is one's spouse. The image of the shepherd lover as a gazelle or a young stag on the hills introduces and concludes these verses, which describe another. The broader context of scripture indicates that the right time is marriage and the right person is one's spouse. The image of the shepherd lover as a gazelle or a young stag on the hills introduces and concludes these verses, which describe another outdoor rendezvous between the two lovers. See, 2. 8. Leaping. Reflects his joy and excitement to see her. Over the mountains. The mountains and hills are symbolic of the obstacles that must be surmounted so the lovers can be together. 2. 9. Gazelle. Known for its speed and agility, the gazelle serves well as an image for the woman's excitement as she longs for her lover to come to her. 2. 10. 13. Spring is a time of fertility, and thus the images of spring in these verses contribute to the picture of an intimate rendezvous. 2. 14. Let me see your face. The switch to the feminine form of the possessive pronoun your suggests that VV 14. 15 should be assigned to the shepherd. 2. 15. Little foxes that spoil the vineyards. The foxes are the one negative element in the otherwise idyllic spring setting of VV. 10. 15. And they perhaps represent aggressive suitors who threaten the relationship with the young woman and her beloved. They could also represent her brothers. The imperative with no specific subject is like a passive, may the foxes be caught. And the whole verse is a wish by the lovers that nothing should be allowed to interfere with their lovemaking. 
216 he grazes among the lilies. In view of the context, this is most likely a metaphor for lovemaking. See notes on 215, 62, 217 until the day breathes and the shadows flee. Traditionally, these lines have been taken with what follows, but they seem to make better sense when read with V. The lovers have been together through the night, and when day breaks, they must part. The young man's return to the hills marks the end of the unit that opened in VA 2817 note. Alternatively, she may have declined his invitation to sexual love that is offered too soon. Chapter 3, 315. This seeking fine story has a more ominous counterpart in 5283. One on my bed by night I sought. Found him not. The young woman is not with her lover, but alone on her bed, and the verb sought repeated twice underscores her intense desire to be with him. While the fact that she found him not indicates at least some level of tension or frustration within her. I will arise now. I will seek. The young woman is not passive, but boldly takes the initiative to go out and find her lover. Three, three. The watchman. The presence of watchmen patrolling the city streets indicates that it is night, and their role is more positive here than in five, seven. Three, four. I found him and would not let him go. The passionate search is over. He is in her arms, and she will not let him go. My mother's house. Chamber. Again, the young woman takes the initiative, bringing her lover to the chamber of her mother. And since the young woman was conceived in this chamber, it is obviously a place of sexual intimacy. Three, five. The second occurrence of the refrain, like the first one, two, seven, follows a scene of lovemaking, and is another reminder that lovemaking should await the right time with the right person. Three, six, eleven. This is the fourth time that the young woman has pictured her lover as a king. One, four, twelve, two, four. These verses celebrate the joy of the regal wedding day. Verse eleven. Given that the song is not a drama with a tight plot and that sexual intimacy has already taken place several times, we are not to interpret these verses as describing a wedding that is chronologically sequential to the previous material. Dischronologization, not ordering events chronologically, is common in both Hebrew prose and poetry. Three, eight against terror by night. Solomon's men formed a bodyguard for protection from marauders, especially as weddings were celebrated at nightfall. But the verse has a double reference. There is also the night introduced in, which was spoiled by the young woman's own terror by night. These fears are banished at least for a time by the splendid vision of Solomon with his fighting men. An alternative name for Jerusalem, C15 for daughters of Jerusalem, the crown. This is not the king's crown, the sort of garland worn by brides and grooms at ancient weddings. The custom was abandoned by Jews in their sorrow caused by the tragic war with Rome and the loss of Jerusalem, AD 70. A rabbinic proverb states that a bridegroom resembles a king, his mother. The mother plays a prominent role in the song 163469-8125. There is no reference to a father, which is in keeping with what we find in other love poetry in the ancient Near East. The day of his wedding, the real Solomon had many weddings, one kin. 11 3. The one day in view here may be a romantic ideal or a fond remembrance. Okay, well, I think probably um, Sproul's earlier notes are probably beginning to make sense to you if this is some something that you've read before. Um, the obviousness of this book that, yes, marriage points to um, Jesus and the church, and we also see that not every metaphor in this is a direct... You, you, it's obvious. Anyways, I'll just read it over again What that quote that he had said. Um it, he said, while avoiding the excesses of the allegorical approach to, to the song, the reader is certainly invited to reflect on the song's themes as windows into our relationship with God. So yeah, that first part of the sentence is important, and the whole thing is important. So, uh, But yeah, I do recommend that uh, I, I'll put this sermon up here our Bibles to the song. Um, because this is, this is a good sermon. Um, but that being said, uh, let's read um let's read second corinthians 12 so open up in your bible to second corinthians chapter 12 second corinthians 12 i must go on boasting boasting though there is nothing to be gained by it i will go on to visions and revelations of the lord I know a man in Christ who, 14 years ago, was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I have been a fool. You forced me to it, for I ought to have been commended by you. For I was not at all inferior to these super-apostles, even though I am nothing. The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with utmost patience, with signs and wonders and mighty works. For in what were you less favored than the rest of the churches, except that I myself did not burden you? Forgive me this wrong. Here for the third time I am ready to come to you, 
and I will not be a burden, for I seek not what is yours, but you. For children are not obligated to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. I will most gladly spend and be spent for your souls. If I love you more, am I to be loved less? But granting that I myself did not burden you, I was crafty, you say, and got the better of you by deceit. Did I take advantage of you through any of those whom I sent to you? I urged Titus to go and sent the brother with him. Did Titus take advantage of you? Did we not act in the same spirit? Did we not take the same steps? Have you been thinking all along that we have been defending ourselves to you? It is in the sight of God that we have been speaking in Christ, and all for your upbuilding, beloved. For I fear that perhaps when I come I may find you not as I wish, and that you may find me not as you wish, that perhaps there may be quarreling, jealousy, anger, hostility, slander, gossip, conceit, and disorder. I fear that when I come again, my God may humble me before you, and I may have to mourn over many of those who sinned earlier and have not repented of the impurity, sexual immorality, and sensuality that they have practiced. Behind Okay, well, what a great passage, um, Paul's longing for their, um, purity in Christ. What a, like, what a good chapter to read in cohesion with what we're reading now, but also, you know, what a good book to read in cohesion with that, because, um, Corinthi Cor <laughs> Corinth was, uh, was messy, man. We need Jesus, just like we need Jesus, but, um. Um, I just always love this chapter about, like, Paul is not, like, he doesn't want to boast in himself. Um, so good. You know, let not your own lips praise you, but another, another's instead. And, um, and this, this verse is so good. I j always love this verse. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. That... Jesus said this to Paul, which is also so beautiful, just the, I love reading, like, the interactions with, like, Jesus and Paul, like, yeah, because, like, the, you know, the road to Aramaeus, and, um, and then, you know, just even thinking about, like, like, there's this verse where it says, the Lord stood near, near to him, I think, it was, like, in a time when he was, like, suffering, so it's, like, it just so good he says for this uh, Paul says for the sake of Christ then I am content with weaknesses he says I am content with weaknesses insults hardships persecutions and calamities for when I am weak then I am strong because God is his strength he, he is not He's not living, saying, I'm such a strong Christian. No, he's saying, I'm weak, but my God is strong. He's so strong. And we are to become less, and Christ to become more. God is our strength. Not to us, but to him be the glory. So, yeah, there's a lot here. So I'm going to let Brother Scroll take over with the notes. Then we'll close our time in prayer. But I encourage you to keep meditating on this and read through it again. Second Corinthians 12. Chapter 12, 12 1, 6 In these verses, Paul continues his boasting with the topic of a vision of heaven. His account contains some unexpected elements. Paul is not permitted to repeat the things he heard in the vision, and afterward he receives a painful thorn v7 note sent by God to keep him humble. A man in Christ. Although he speaks indirectly and even seems to distinguish between the recipient of the vision and himself v5, Paul clearly means himself, as becomes clear in v7. Through this transparent pretense of distancing himself from an anonymous individual so privileged to receive a visionary revelation, Paul's example signals his strong disapproval of self-promotion 10:18. Third heaven. According to a common enumeration, the first heaven is the atmosphere of the birds and clouds, the second is the sky in which we see the stars, and the third is heaven, the invisible dwelling place of God. For fourteen years Paul had not made this experience a focus of his teaching, as some would have done. 
His focus was the message of Christ, what we proclaim is not ourselves but Jesus Christ as Lord 4 5. 12 3 Paradise that is the third heaven of V. 2 The GK, word for paradise derived from a term meaning garden, is used with various meanings outside the NT but in the NT. All three occurrences, V3, also Luke 23 43, Reverend 2 7, refer to heaven, the place where the saints dwell with God. 12 6 I refrain, Paul wanted people to evaluate him on the basis of their first-hand knowledge of him. 12 7 A thorn, many possibilities have been suggested for this thorn such as a physical ailment of some sort, in the flesh, cf. Gal 4 13 15, a harassing demon, a messenger of Satan, or the constant harassment of Jewish persecutors. Throughout the history of the church no agreement has been reached among hundreds of commentators. As it stands, the thorn of Paul's experiences is readily applied to a variety of trials faced in this life. Few of God's servants have been free from at least some kind of hindrance, weakness, or opposition. 12 8 The Lord, Paul's usual expression to refer to Christ not to God the Father. Although prayers in the NT are most often directed to God the Father, this is an example of prayer directed to Christ cf. Acts 1 24 7 59 1 Cor. 16 22, Rev. 22 20. It is striking that in his boasting, Paul testifies about a request that God did not fulfill, my power is made perfect in weakness. God will accomplish his purposes without taking from his servant the thorn that seems to hinder him. But despite human weaknesses, God's grace accomplishes his purposes in a fallen world. This promise from God no doubt gave Paul strength and encouragement in subsequent sufferings. Paul shortly ties the general principle to its source, the cross of Christ 13 4. Paul's whole response to attacks on his apostolic authority has been patterned consciously on Christ and him crucified. And not on the so-called Jesus, and the different gospel, that his opponents foisted upon the erring Corinthians 11 4 note. Paul's spiritual view is so clear that he can see his sufferings as reasons for rejoicing, for he knows that in them, all of Christ's power is at work. 12, 11 You force me, Paul has to boast about his apostolic weakness because the Corinthians who know him well, have not defended him against the false apostles, but instead have been seduced 11 1 3 by inflated self-claims and untrue criticism of Paul. 12 Signs of a true apostle, Paul identifies the signs of a true apostle with miracles, wonders and mighty works. Throughout this epistle, Paul also points to other marks that distinguish him from the false apostles, the changed lives of the Corinthians, 3 2 3, the blameless character of his ministry, 6 3 10. 8 20 21, his genuine love for his churches, 6 11 12 7 3 11, sacrificial endurance of suffering, 6 3 11 20. In addition to these marks, Paul is ready to mention miraculous signs as divinely authenticating his apostolic ministry. See 1 Cor, 13 2, theological note, the apostles, on P 19 12, 12, 14 for the third time. See introduction, date, and occasion. The first visit was on Paul's second missionary journey, Acts 18 1 18. The second visit 2 1 is not recorded in Acts but occurred sometime during Paul's extended stay at Ephesus, Acts 19 1 41. I seek not what is yours but you, unlike those preachers whose goal is their own financial reward, 12 16 got the better of you by deceit. Perhaps Paul's opponents were saying that his apparent selflessness was a trick to deceive them. Paul answers that he never exploited them through others. Re 17, Titus was coming ahead of Paul, 8 6 6 12 19. Paul again emphasizes that he has not been speaking for his own reputation or glory, but for the good of the church and for the glory of God. Again, he reveals a strong awareness that everything he writes and does is, in the sight of God. See note on 2 10. Paul's fatherly ties with the Corinthian church are strong, and he knows that if he returns to find some of them his children, v 14 still unruly, it will be humiliating for him. Just as parents are humiliated by the misbehavior of their children. Many of those who sinned earlier and have not repented, false apostles were not the only problem in Corinth. There were some people still engaging in sin, and Paul warns them, C1 Cor, 5 1 2 6 9 20. R.C. Sproul ed., The Reformation Study Bible, English Standard Version 2015 Edition, Orlando, Florida Reformation Trust, 2015-2065-2067. Again, the notes are so helpful. Um, so, yeah, please keep reading the, the scripture that we read, though, and uh, I would really encourage you to focus in on 2 Corinthians 12, um, the verses about, um, yeah, the, the, by which what we just focused on when I, when I went over what took out to me. But, um, yeah, let's close our time in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you are the most beautiful King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and that uh, you are our everything, God. You are worth everything. You are the treasure. Um, you are the pearl of great price, oh God. Um, the, and truly, according to your word and how your word puts it, not not anything else, God. Um, <clears throat> yeah, thank you for scripture, Lord. Thank you for giving us your word, Lord, that is sufficient and it's inerrant and it's infallible and that it needs nobody to affirm it. It is the truth, period. But Lord, thank you so much for giving me eyes to see so that I can say, yes, this is God's word and now I have salvation also because I've learned about Jesus. I just, I thank you so much, God. You're so good, and I pray that you just continue to be with us the rest of this day, Lord, that you be glorified, that your people would be um, blessed um, by you, Lord, and by your word. 
so thank you for today. Um, we need you. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for being amazing. And um, even when our stupid eyes can't see it, would you just give us eyes to see today, Lord, and ears to hear, just um, obedient hearts to follow, Lord, out of love for you, Lord, because you're our treasure. And so, yeah, thank you so much for today, and just yeah, and grace and peace. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.